Thank you, Katrina, for the uh, generous introduction. And so uh, let's get started. Thank you all for, for coming to this session. Uh, I changed the title a little bit, not that it really matters, but including Asian Americans in racial justice conversations. Uh, after the introduction, uh, talk about America as a racial project, uh, differential racialization of other non-whites with special attention to Asian Americans, and then theorizing race in a multi-group setting. And so I want to begin by talking about where and when I enter. So I was born in Korea. And I say Korea, not South Korea, even though it was South Korea. I call it Korea because the two, South and North, were created by uh, these imperial powers. Uh, and I do consider the border between them a wound that uh, has never healed, uh, even though I have the hope and dream of a unified Korea. Uh, I fear that it is a wound that will never heal. So my family came uh, to the United States in 1970, and so part of that also includes that Asian American is something that I was not born. I, you know, like in Korea, you're not born Asian American. Uh, Asian American is something that I became when I came to the United States, and Asian American is something that I'm still becoming. It's not static. Um, growing up in Korea, Oh, I'm sorry, growing up in, in this tiny town uh, of 3,500 in Ohio. Uh, so the other thing is, I also want to talk a little bit about my name. So uh, people know me as Bob, Robert. I wasn't born that either. So my parents gave me that uh, name when I came to the United States. I also wonder sometimes if that also helps to explain why I'm here. So if I were Sung Chol, would I be here? Would I have had other barriers that I faced throughout my career where people would have wondered, well, Sung Chol, like, you know, what, what kind of name is Sung Chol? Does he speak English? Uh, and other things like that, the things that come sometimes with the name. If you're wondering how I became Bob, so I went to kindergarten. There were three Roberts in my kindergarten class. Uh, White teacher looked at White Robert number one and said, what do you want to be called? He said, Robert. The teacher looked at White Robert number two and asked, what do you want to be called? He said, Rob. And so she looked at me and said, well, I guess that makes you Bob. And so I went to school, Robert. I came home, Bob, and I told my mother that. It's like, well, then what is she going to say about that? She's like, I guess that's how they do things in the United States. Now, the formative moment or experience that I had with racism uh, took place when I was in sixth grade, and I endured a month-long festival of name-calling, uh, things that people who look like me are, are usually called. Uh, and I fought back as I could, um, but it persisted. Uh, the teachers saw and heard it, but kind of, kind of pretended not to know what was going on. It all came to a stop, though, uh, when one of my classmates called me the N-word. Uh, and there's a part of me that wanted to say to my classmate, but I'm not that. The rational part, it's like, you know, we have these categories, like, I'm, I'm this. You know, you can call me those Asian, you know, bad names, but you can't call me that. Um, but I was that to him. I was the other in their midst. Uh, and although I would never claim to know what it is like to be black, in the United States, I do know what it is like to be an other. And that's what I go back to when I try to think about the experiences that I've had and the connections that I have to different kinds of racism and discrimination, uh, the place of otherness that I actually know that all of you are able to find in yourselves. And you might think a little bit or a moment of reflection where you might consider a time in your own life when you have been an other. Now, the thing about that experience also was that um, it stopped because I just started crying and I couldn't stop crying. And the teachers and administrators couldn't ignore that. And that's when it stopped. Uh, and I was fortunate that my father, uh, who was a librarian, catalog services librarian at, at the small college that was there, uh, he applied for a Fulbright to go to Korea. So he worked with a, a library there. And I think that's probably uh, the best thing that he could have done for me. So I spent four months uh, with people who look like me. 
uh, so different from my experience in Ohio. And the other thing that he did was, uh, I didn't go to school, we couldn't afford the international school there, so I learned Taekwondo about nine hours every day, Monday through Saturday, and it gave me the strength uh, in some ways to be able to come back. But I wonder sometimes if I hadn't had that sort of recuperative experience uh, if, uh, if I'd be where I, if I would be where I am now. Now, the other thing about it is that I didn't have the words or the, the ideas to be able to understand that experience. And so that experience with racism and all things with regard to racism, I just put it into a little box, put it in the sh closet, and it's like try to ignore it. I tried to shield myself in the world of achievement and accomplishment. I was just gonna be better at everything than everybody with this idea that in some ways that it would insulate me from the racism that is out there in the world. Didn't, you know, and it didn't work, <laughs> but uh, I did operate much of my life in denial. Now, part of that experience uh, in terms of growing up and also in college and in law school. Uh, for people who look like me, there's often this sense uh, of thinking about us or regarding us as forever foreign. So on the left, uh, there's a headline from MSNBC 1998, American Beats Kwan. Uh, Tara Lipinski, a teammate of Michelle Kwan, beat her, but the headline was, American beats Kwan. Now, MSNBC got a lot of flack for that, and one of the news organizations that gave them a lot of flack was the Seattle Times. They're like, how stupid of them, like, you know? And then four years later, when Sarah Hughes uh, beat Michelle Kwan, Hughes as good as gold, American outshines Kwan. Now, I say this in part, or I use these examples to show in some ways how sometimes it becomes so easy, the cognitive shortcuts that people have, so that when you see someone like me, when you see someone like Michelle Kwan, they are forever foreign. Uh, and so one of the things to think a little bit about when you're thinking about how do we include Asian Americans in racial justice conversations and understanding that one of the barriers or things that we face is this idea or notion that we are always forever foreign. So when we're thinking about including Asian Americans in these conversations, one of the things is to really think about the barriers that exist. So two barriers uh, I think that are critical and two that I hope to address in this conversation are lack of knowledge, uh, and then also misinformation. So lack of knowledge and misinformation. So those are two things that I'm going to try to talk us through. And then at the end, uh, if I have time, we have an ex exercise. Uh, some conceptual takeaways. Uh, there's this idea or concept of intersectionality that you may or may not have heard before. So intersectionality uh, came up uh, in part as a critical race theory term by Kimberly Crenshaw. And part of it was observing what happened in Title VII litigation. And so if a black woman is, does not uh, get a job or is not promoted, sometimes she would lose her claim because the employer was able to show to the court that they hired black people Sure, they're all black men, and they hired white women. I'm sorry, white people, or I'm sorry, they hire women, and sure, they're all white women, not understanding that sometimes discrimination operates in a way at the intersections and something that's critical to understand. And so then to think about how it also applies with regard to persons of Asian ancestry. This idea of Asians as being forever foreign, uh, and then this notion of the model minority myth, something that lumps all Asian American groups together, erasing diversity and differences within the group, and then also is used uh, to blame other groups for not being model. Part of the history of the model minority myth is that in 1966, this Berkeley demographer, William Peterson, wrote a very influential article that was in the New York Times Magazine. And it talked about the Japanese American community and said, look at this group. We did terrible things to them. We put them in camps but they've worked hard, they haven't complained, and look at how they're doing, they're succeeding. 
And so in some ways saying that, well, that's what other groups should be doing. That's what other groups should be emulating. But you also see how there's a blaming function so that if other groups are not succeeding, well, that's their own fault. They're doing the wrong things, they're complaining. The other thing is that William Peterson's article was also in the context of challenging uh, Lyndon B. Johnson's Great Society programs. Uh, the other thing I talked about was in terms of the way that it erases diversity in, in and among Asian American groups is that there's actually tremendous variation within each of the groups. And so uh, instead of like everybody doing really well, it's really a bimodal distribution. And the, those on the lower uh, end of the curve uh, end up being ignored by this. And then the idea of the bamboo ceiling. So uh, sometimes uh, Asian Americans are regarded as good worker bees, but are we leaders? Uh, and the way that that can then affect who takes on or who is seen as being a leader in our organizations, in our courts, in our schools. So then when I think about race, uh, we can think about, well, traits. Uh, early on in terms of the literature, you had this idea that, well, there are, uh, that intelligence uh, is associated with different racial groups, criminality is associated different racial groups, violence, work ethic, and on. And all of these have been debunked, but it's sort of like whack-a-mole. So even though the scientific basis for racism has been debunked, it's come back up in terms of stereotypes that operate, especially with regard to the cognitive shortcuts that we may have learned as, as you know, how implicit bias operates. So instead of saying that, well, you know, certain groups are biologically inferior, well, we just have stereotypes or associations with these groups, and then we act upon these associations. So then we might think a little bit about what function race plays in the United States. And uh, my hypothesis in terms of the function that race plays in the United States uh, is that it operates both to unite and to divide. There is a clear uh, reason or way that race has operated. And so I sometimes think about or call America a racial project. One event that I keep going back to, and this is during the colonial era, is Bacon's Rebellion in 1676. So in Bacon's Rebellion, approximately 6,000 European bondsmen, indentured servants, joined together with 2,000 Africans. They were uh, bondsmen, indentured servants, uh, slaves, and also free Africans. They joined together in an uprising. Uh, they actually marched on Jamestown and they burned it. Uh, that scared people who were in power because the people in power were, you know, what the experience was, the people at the lower social strata joining together, trying to claim more, to get some of the privilege uh, that they were denied. Uh, the people at the top we're very concerned about how do we keep something like this from taking place again? And this goes back to the function that race plays. And so what happened was that the colony of Virginia started to even more systematically create differences in terms of treatment. And so black people who commit certain kinds of crimes are punished much more severely than white people who commit certain kinds of crimes. White people get to bear arms, black people, even free black people. And I say black because they were African at the time, like whiteness and blackness had not quite emerged in terms of, of race. It's, it's something that's produced. Uh, but um, all of these disabilities and disadvantages are piled upon the African people. All of these privileges are given to poor white people. And so even though they're not brought up to the level of the ruling elites, they're given something. And part of that is to create a divide so that they will not join together. Uh, there's an amazing book by uh, Judge A. Leon Hickett Botham Jr. who goes through how this occurred in each of the colonies and then all of this gets carried forward. But one critical thing about the differences, the disabilities and the privileges, is that this occurred during a time before there's social media. And so what you need to do is you need to remind white people, the poor white people, of the privileges that they get. So this is the tactic that they had. Parish clerks or church wardens, once each spring and fall, 
should read these laws in full to the congregants. It's like, look at this. This is what you get. This is what you get. And all of this to reinforce this idea or notion in terms of the privileges that even white people at the bottom of the social strata got. Sheriffs were ordered to do the same thing uh, at, their, uh, at their courthouses. And so this gets carried forward into something that I describe as a racial compact, which is our constitution. Uh, and uh, historians have, have identified at least 10 provisions in it that uh, either directly or indirectly um, promote or protect the institution of slavery. Uh, it gets written into this document. It's a compromise. And that's carrying forward what had occurred before in each of the colonies. When we think about the antebellum racial ordering, we have the courts being involved in this. So it wasn't just those who were able to affect this politically uh, through the uh, ratification of the Constitution, but you get the very famous case of Prigg versus Pennsylvania, which is the fugitive slave law case. And because of the operation of that law, you get things like slave catchers being able to go into the North, grab uh, people, and often they were free. And for those of you who have not seen this film, a really remarkable, uh, dramatic presentation of this story. And then to be able to do it without any interference of the states that often tried to pass laws to prevent their citizens from being treated in this way. And then you get Dred Scott versus Sanford, where black people, regardless of in, you know, slave or free status can never be citizens of the United States. They can never be members of this political body. And it was critical because, you know, for those who, you know, this is, this is an audience of, of, for court management, right? So in terms of the federal courts, one way that a black person could try to get into the federal court was this diversity of citizenship. But if you're not a citizen, you can't get in this way. And so by keeping them out of the courts, you preclude them from being able to take advantage of our court system and everything that flows from that. So even after the Civil War and the Reconstruction Amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, which is then followed by redemption, uh, when in 1877, as part of the Hayes-Tilden Compromise, they decide to throw the election to Hayes, and but the agreement was that the Union troops would be pulled out of the South, and then you had all manner of things taking place to reinforce the previous racial order. And so there's this amazing book by W.E.B. Du Bois about, uh, you know, he calls it Black Reconstruction in America and, and you know, that period. But he identified this thing that he calls the psychological wages of whiteness. So it must be remembered that the white group of laborers, while they received a low wage, were compensated in part by a sort of public and psychological wage. And so what it is is, sure, we're not gonna give you a lot in terms of material wealth or power, but you're gonna get this. You're going to be treated better than black people, the people who have just been freed, the people that we fought a war to free. On the other hand, in the same way, the Negro was subject to public insult, to submit to various badges of inferiority. But the effect of this is to keep wages low, because if you keep the two different groups ever from joining together, and each is threatened, well, if you don't comply, we can hire this other group. If you don't comply, we can hire this other group. There's a really wonderful film by uh, Peter Sales called Maitwan, and I think it's uh, the coal mines in West Virginia where white uh, coal miners go on strike and the mine owners bring in black people to break the strike. Uh, it's a way then to keep each group insecure. And so we see there, the result is uh, the wages could be kept low, the whites fearing to be supplanted by Negro labor, and the Negroes always being threatened by the substitution of white labor. And white labor saw in every advance of Negroes a threat to their racial prerogatives. It becomes a zero-sum game, and so something that you protect, you protect your privilege, and which also always requires making sure that the disadvantaged remain disadvantaged. 
And so then in terms of the post-bellum racial ordering, the way that the US Supreme Court gets involved, you get the so-called civil rights cases where uh, as part of fulfilling the promise of the 14th Amendment, Congress passed laws, for example, protecting the right of black people to be free of discrimination in public accommodations of so movie theaters, public transportation, things like that, dining halls. Um, and the US Supreme Court looks at this and says, well, that's all just private discrimination. And so because it's private, the law can't step in and so then allows private discrimination to continue without any court intervention. You get Giles versus Harris, which is a terrible Voting Rights Act uh, that uh, ensures that municipalities, local governments, and states can put into law um, restrictions uh, that limit the power or prevent black people from registering or voting. Uh, you get Plessy versus Ferguson, the very famous well-known case that established the doctrine of separate but equal. Now, Plessy versus Ferguson, Ferguson I, some people don't know that it was a test case. It was this intentional case that was brought to challenge, and in this instance, not private discrimination in terms of a railway company that privately discriminated against black people, but instead it was the state of Louisiana. Now, if you remember a moment ago, I said in the civil rights cases, oh, well, private discrimination, we can't do anything. There's a line in the civil rights cases that says, well, we think things would be different if it was the state that did something. And so then, you know, people are paying attention to that and think, oh, when Louisiana passes this law, we can bring this test case. The other fascinating thing about Plessy versus Ferguson is that Homer Plessy was one eighth black by descent to the extent that you can say, oh, somebody is one eighth black versus, you know, like, I don't know that people parse out quite in that way, but he was light enough to pass. He didn't pass, but he was light enough to pass. They actually had to stage his arrest because a conductor looking at him in the white car wouldn't know that, oh, there's a black man in the white car. So they actually had to stage the arrest. But part of that was intentional because they were trying to put forward a very sophisticated notion of the social construction of race. It's not like there's something about him that, you know, like that, that you know, creates this fear, but law has created this identity that somehow needs to be, you know, that requires in some ways the state to protect whiteness by keeping him from the car. Buchanan versus Worley is in some ways a high point because when, uh, I want to say it was, it was uh, the, the city of Erie, uh, when they passed a law that uh, zoned different parts of the city as, well, this is the black part, this is the white part, the U.S. Supreme Court said you can't do that. Now, that was good, but what took its place, and this is the problem sometimes, uh, whenever some advance occurs, they, they think of something else. It's sort of like whack-a-mole. Um, you think you, you, you got it, but you didn't. And uh, discrimination then was effected through racially restrictive covenants in terms of property deeds. So what they couldn't do publicly, so zoning, the government, the state is doing it, ended up being able to be executed privately through private contracts. Now, one critical part that also connects up um, the disabilities and disadvantages that black people face that produces the black race in terms of legal, thinking about it as a legal or social category, whiteness also is socially constructed. And so W.E.B. Du Bois talked about the discovery of personal whiteness among the world's people is a very modern thing, a 19th and 20th century matter. And then the historian Nell Irvin Painter, fantastic book that she wrote in 2010, talks about the notion of American whiteness will continue to evolve as it has since the creation of the American Republic. I think we're in, in a period where we are seeing an intensification of white racial identity, and a lot of it is around things like affirmative action, the feeling of um, being put upon by programs like that or DEI programs that is actually fostering an intense uh, intensification of white racial identity. Now, 
So far, I've been primarily focusing on the story in terms of black and white, which is often a more familiar story to many people. I think it's critical when we think about America that we broaden the racial frame. Um, these are two books that I've been sitting with, and I encourage you, if you're interested in this, to, to, to explore them. I'll talk a little bit about uh, these, but to go into it as fully would require you to sit with me for three days, and I, I, I don't know that you know me well enough to want to do that. Uh, but these are, are really wonderful books. Now, in terms of differential racialization, because that's another way to think about this, so different groups are racialized in different ways. With regard to indigenous peoples in America, it went through a series of phases. So they tried different things, and when they decided one wasn't quite accomplishing what they wanted, they went on to another. So initially, extermination and dislocation. Then it was removal and relocation then the allotment period and assimilation. And allotment meant taking the reservations and cutting them into pieces and giving them to individuals, which was also individual Indians, which was actually intended as a way to steal more land from them, which they did. But it was an attempt in some ways, and I apologize for calling it that, but that's what they considered it. But it was an attempt to civilize them by introducing them to the world of private property ownership uh, as a way then to bring them into US society. Then you had termination and relocation. Then this period also includes the Indian boarding schools and the terrible, terrible, terrible chapter. Uh, that is still, um, I don't know how communities, families, and individuals come back from that. Uh, and then uh, followed by this new thing called self-determination, which was really still meant to erase Indian people. With regard to Latinas and Latinos, you have conquest as the initial way that Latinas and Latinos come into this country through uh, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848. But one of the things about it is that it made people who were Mexican citizens U.S. citizens. They had a year, and you know, at the end of the year, they could opt affirmatively to remain Mexican citizens, but everybody else by default became U.S. citizens. Now, one really strange artifact that came from that was this notion that some people have written about is accidental whiteness. So there's this case uh, in Ray Rodriguez, and it was either 1878 or 1898, uh, but this Mexican immigrant uh, tries to become naturalized. And at that time, the naturalization statute said white persons or persons of African nativity or descent. So he had two doors that he could try to, you know, to enter to become a US citizen, the white door or the black door. And then when you look at his case, he tried to come in through the Mexican door. Uh, he said to the court, I'm Mexican, I'm full blood Mexican. And so the court looked at him and said, well, we got the white door and the black door. And the court then actually reached back to the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo and said that because we allow people who look like you to become US citizens, that means that you are formally legally white, which then allows you to become naturalized. Then that actually led to LULAC in the early uh, uh, 1900s, uh, 1920s, 1930s, uh, and LULAC is the League of United Latin American Citizens, they actually pursued what some scholars call the other white strategy. And so when they were excluded from movie theaters or from swimming pools or things like that, they said, you can't do that to us because we're white, pointing back to their own legal whiteness. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't, but ultimately it backfired. So the state of Texas, there was this case, Hernandez versus Texas, and Pete Hernandez uh, was convicted of committing a crime, and he said that, well, you have never let a person of Mexican ancestry be on a grand or petit jury. Uh, and the court, the Texas courts looked at him and said, well, Mexican isn't a race, and so how does the equal protection help you here. And then they went even further than that and said, well, y'all have been claiming to be legally white. And when I look at the grand juries and the petit juries, got white people on them. Sure, no Mexican, per, no person of Mexican ancestry has been on these juries. 
But a race discrimination claim, well, you're white, white people are on the juries, no race discrimination. The US Supreme Court in 18, uh, I'm sorry, not 18, wow, uh, 1954 said no uh, to that. Uh, but that was a certain notion of trying to claim in some ways legal whiteness because that was a doorway or pathway in. But one of the things about it is that it didn't anticipate that they would encounter discrimination as being non-Anglos. And by asserting a claim of legal whiteness, they weren't actually dismantling the system of race subordination. It was just, we're white too. Uh, and that's where I think it was an ultimately self-defeating strategy. Attractive in some ways because it got some early victories, but ultimately self-defeating. Now, with regard to Asian Americans, um, I know I think it was introduced as Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in, in DEI conversations. I try to be careful about this, uh, in part because the history and trajectory of Pacific Islanders is very, very different from that of Asian Americans. And so I don't want to commit the sin of using an umbrella term and pretend that I'm talking also about Pacific Islanders when actually I'm not. And I'm not actually able in this presentation to fully go through that, but I I do want to highlight it because there are dangers that come from aggregating and disaggregating. There are positives that also come from disaggregating and aggregating. Asian American is an aggregation and there are positives and negatives that come with that. One thing that I noticed on a task force uh, that we uh, led in Washington State on race and the criminal legal system is that uh, we did an earlier version in, in 2010, 2011, we repeated it after the George Floyd murder in 2020 to 2022. But we were able to get better data this time. <clears throat> Excuse me. We were able to get better data this time. And what we noticed was that if you look at uh, police killings of civilians, Asian Americans, if you lump everybody together, Asian Pacific Americans are half as likely to be killed by police as white people. That sounds good, right? But then, <laughs> but then when you disaggregate Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders, we notice that Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders in Washington state were either 3.3 to 3.6 times more likely to be killed by the police than white people. And so what we have is that when you aggregate, you erase, but when we disaggregate, we see something, and we see something that we didn't know about before, and if you didn't, don't know about it, you're not gonna do something about it. And so I'm not saying that it is always bad to aggregate, um, and I'm not saying that it's always good to disaggregate, it's always to be mindful of it, to pay attention to what difference it makes, why you're doing it, and what you might lose. And then things that I've talked about before, themes with regard to the eight, Differential racialization of Asian Americans includes this idea of foreign, forever foreign and the idea of model minority. Now I'm gonna go into the detail about the racial construction, uh, the racialization of Asian Americans. And so um, early in the pandemic, I got an email from TED-Ed and inviting me to do something. And I got really excited because I thought they were inviting me to give a TED talk. And then they quickly disabuse me of that notion and they say, well, we want you to write the script for an animated video. <laughs> and after I got over uh, the, the, the disappointment of not being invited to give a TED talk, I went ahead and, and did the script. And I'm so pleased that I did uh, because uh, this short five and a half minute um, animated uh, uh, video has uh, over a million views. Uh, which is about a million more than I've read my law review articles. Um, so, and if you listen to, if you, if, you, if you watch this, you'll hear somebody with a British accent. It's not me with a faux British accent. I didn't even get to narrate the, 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 the thing, but I did write the script. I was, still am very pleased with it. So one of the things that I talk about in this was the case of People versus Hall, 1854. 
Uh, and in this case, George Hall, a white man, had killed Ling Sing, a Chinese immigrant. And in a little bit of a surprise, he was actually convicted of this murder. He then uh, appealed this to the California Supreme Court and said, lower court committed an error. And the error was that they admitted testimony from Chinese witnesses. And George Hall said, you can't do that. But the statute at the time said, no black or mulatto person or Indian shall be allowed to give evidence in favor of or against a white man. Right, we're all good at like looking at, at statutes and, and things like categories, black, mulatto, or Indian. What do you do with somebody from the Mongolian race? And the court struggled with that, but the court didn't want George Hall's conviction to stand, so here's what they did. They reached back to ethnographic theory at the time, and they said that Indians in America came from China over the Bering Strait, the, the land bridge when it was there. And so then they said Indian means Asians, or Asians are Indians. And so therefore, the testimony was improperly admitted. But then realizing perhaps that they were on thin ground, they said, well, black we'll treat as a catch-all category. Uh, and so black just means non-white. I mean, obviously, when you're doing statutory construction or interpretation, you would say, well, that makes no sense, because why would they have the term mulatto? Right? You wouldn't have that if really black was everything else, but that was good enough for the California Supreme Court in 1854, and uh, George Hall's conviction was overturned. Now, injustice in that particular case, but think about what the effect of that was. There was so much violence that took place in the West against people of Chinese ancestry, and many of those incidents of violence could not be then addressed by the courts. There's this amazing book by the historian Beth Lou Williams. It's called The Chinese Must Go, and she documents many of the uh, many of the, the incidents of violence. So that's how the California Supreme Court was trying to figure out what box to put people of, of Asian ancestry. Uh, this led to uh, California seeking other ways to address the so-called Chinese problem. They initially tried to do it by their own restrictions with regard to immigration. The US Supreme Court said, no, that's not for you states to do. That's for us to do. And so then once that happened, the campaign switched to the federal strategy to try to bring about Chinese exclusion at the federal level. And uh, you had these political cartoons. On the one on the left, um, the people up at the top are, are understood to be European immigrants who came to the United States. Uh, and then they built, you know, the idea is to build a wall, throwing down the ladder by which they rose. And so in some ways, that's a critique of the stance that uh, European immigrants were taking. In the middle, um, there's a fascinating uh, cartoon that has stereotypical faces of different European immigrant groups working together. And you also see a black person who is working together with them to do Chinese exclusion, trying to say that we're all together, they're the real other. Now, there's a fascinating um, political cartoon that I have not been able to locate yet, uh, but that I've uh, read descriptions about. But in the black press, there was this one cartoonist who had a picture of a brick that was labeled Chinese exclusion hitting a Chinese person, but then bouncing off the Chinese person and then hitting a black person. And so it was an understanding then that sure, the target of Chinese exclusion is the Chinese person, but if we accept it, don't do anything about it, then we misunderstand the way that it is also going to hurt us. So a deep understanding then of how racial subordination is broader, so that even though it's not us, so it's not our problem, maybe understanding that it really is our problem, that we should think about things in a different way. And then in the cartoon on the right, uh, it says something about the Chinese must go, but then the other part of it is, is also the African uh, American, the black person must go, using a, a term that I'm not going to uh, state here. But this idea that if we're really taking care of the race problem, all of these others must 
go. So eventually uh, that resulted in the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, so it worked. The federal government said, no Chinese laborers can enter into this country. What about all the Chinese laborers who were already in this country? In 1884, Congress passed a, a, a new bill um, that provided a mechanism for Chinese laborers who were already here to be able to go visit China and return. You had to get a certificate of reentry, and this is Che Chanping's certificate of reentry. He had come to the San Francisco Bay Area from China in 1875. He went back to visit his family in 1887, and he got one of these certificates. Then he boarded a steamship, the steamship Belgic, on September 7 or 8, 1888, and transportation technologies being what they were at the time, didn't arrive in San Francisco Harbor until October 7 or October 8, 1888. But the thing is, on October 1st, the president signed a bill that said all these previously issued certificates, no effect. And so it had a double effect. Um, one thing that I haven't been able to track down, in some of the literature, it says that it impacted 20,000 people who had gone overseas who were not able to come back. That seems high to me because at its peak, uh, the population of Chinese immigrants in the United States was about 120 or 140, 120,000 or 140,000. So 20,000 seems high. But it did affect people who were already overseas and couldn't come back. It trapped them over there. But the other thing that it did, it trapped Chinese people in the United States. Because then you can't go back to visit your family because if you go back, you can't ever return. This policy actually worked because the result of this, these changes, included uh, that the population in, of, of Chinese immigrants in the United States went from about 120, 140,000 to about half that in a period of about 30 years. Some people just decided, well, we'll just, we just have to go back. Um, but this case where the US Supreme Court decided this, because he came to court and said, you can't do that. I've got, I have my ticket. I follow the rules. You can't just say that this thing has no effect. Isn't this a right that you have to honor? And you can, you know, the fancy names that go with that, the bill of attainer and, and attainder and things like that. So this is where uh, the, the Constitution and the treatment of people of Asian ancestry gets written through interpretation in a way that allows for extreme discrimination against people of Asian ancestry. And so Marbury versus Madison is a famous case that establishes judicial review and also judicial supremacy and this grand notion that the courts act to uh, prevent the excesses of the political and uh, the, uh, of the political branches of the executive and the legislature. But in Che Chanping, it's going to follow a different path with regard to the border. If there is a race that we deem, and who's the we, right? But that we deem to be uh, the enemy who will not assimilate with us, to be a danger to us, and if we decide to exclude them, that determination by the political branches is final. This last line. This determination is conclusive upon the judiciary. And so this is the idea of the plenary power doctrine, this notion that with regard to matters regarding the border, the political offices, the branches, have plenary power in a way that the court will not say, oh, that's racism, so you can't do that. Racism is permitted with regard to the border because the plenary power doctrine, and it gets carried forward in a series of cases. And it's also the way that national security gets involved. The idea is that this is about national security. That's why the courts should step back from it because we're not the ones who are able to speak about national security. Asians are seen as a threat, a series of actions taken to restrict immigration. The 1875 Page Act uh, is actually neutral on its face but it was enacted to keep Chinese women out. And there are two reasons for that. One, because of the construction of Chinese women as being lewd, lascivious, and prostitutes, but also because they didn't want Chinese women to come to the United States and form families. Because if you have families, and because of the way that anti-miscegenation laws operate, if you have families, 
the communities perpetuate themselves. They make more. Uh, and the way to keep making more is to keep the women out and then also to have the web of anti-miscegenation statutes. Um, after the success of the exclusion of people of Chinese ancestry, uh, capital has a thirst for cheap labor. And so the next group that came in were immigrants from Japan. When immigrants from, from Japan were deemed to be a problem, there was uh, an agreement between the two countries, the so-called Gentlemen's Agreement of 1907-08, where Japan agreed uh, to stop issuing, <clears throat> excuse me, to stop issuing um, <clears throat> visas to uh, laborers. And there's a loophole, though. It was only with regard to laborers. And so the Japanese government actually issued visas for Japanese women to form families in the United States. And that's actually why you had a very different trajectory where the Chinese American community shrunk over time because of the severe gender ratio disparity, gender disparity ratio, those words in some order. Um, whereas with regard to uh, people of, of Japanese ancestry, they were actually able to form families. And so you get intergenerational communities uh, develop uh, through that. And I really appreciate the, the water because I'm, I'm trying to say too many words. So after Japanese labor stopped, uh, the people who want cheap labor turn to South Asia. Uh, once they are deemed to be a problem, they do something called the 1917 uh, Geographic Barred Zone Act. And they just denote, like by longitude and latitude, huge portions of Asia. And then I recently looked at the map of it again, and I realized that was actually the first Muslim travel ban. Uh, it covered all of the Middle East. Uh, once that problem is taken care of, Filipinos start coming in, and they come in under a loophole. Because of the 1898 Spanish-American War, the Philippines became a colony of the United States. So Filipinos are US nationals. US nationals were not subject to the previous or existing immigration restrictions. Once they are deemed to be a problem, and they're deemed to be a problem, including because they like to dance with white women, and there are actually riots, the Watsonville riots, the taxi dance hall riots uh, that, that emerge from that. In 1934, the Tidings McDuffie Act, the federal government, Congress says to the Philippines, we're planning to give you independence. We're not going to give it to you for 10 years, but because we're going to give it to you, we're going to treat you now as no longer US nationals. And so even though they really were, they found a way to keep Filipinos out. All of these things are underwritten and overridden by violence. The other thing, though, the other commonality is that with regard to each groups, initially with regard to the Chinese, certain techniques are developed in terms of how you subordinate or maintain control over Chinese people. And then each of those techniques gets transferred to each of the subsequent groups, Japanese, South Asian, Filipinos. Uh, and the idea really throughout this is that it's the commonality of treatment that creates or produces the Asian American racial subject. Because when we think about, well, what brings together Asian Americans? Why, where, where does that make sense? I mean, in the recent SFFA opinion, I think uh, Chief Justice Roberts, in, in the opinion of the court, and also uh, Justice Gorsuch, question, is there even an Asian American? Like, you know, maybe, maybe I should stop writing about becoming Asian American. Uh, the other thing that operates in addition to keeping people out of the country is preventing them from becoming citizens. 1790 Naturalization Act, free white persons. Uh, 14th Amendment gives us the citi citizenship clause. And then you get the Naturalization Act of 1870, white persons and persons of African nativity or descent, uh, something that I had talked about when I talked about the case of Enri Rodriguez. But what about people who look like me? What happens to them? 
Takao Ozawa tries to become a US citizen and takes his case to the US Supreme Court. And he understood there's a white door and a black door. So he's tried to come in under the white door. He presented his skin to the courts and said, look how white I am. I'm whiter than a lot of the European immigrants. And then they found work by this cultural anthropologist who had visited Japan and wrote about the white people of Japan. I don't know who that cultural anthropologist was talking about, but it's science, right? And so they brought it to the court. Uh, the court said, nah. Uh, the court said, well, we're going to say white equals Caucasian. You're clearly not Caucasian, no matter how white you are. And so you don't get to come in. But then there's this other group that got excited about that. People from South Asia, ethnographic theory at the time, Aryan ancestry. Bhagat Singh Thin comes to court and says, I'm Aryan. I'm more Caucasian than you. And you just said white equals Caucasian. The court looked at him and said, you're pretty brown. Uh, and uh, when the framers you know, did the Constitution and did the first Naturalization Act, uh, white clearly didn't mean people like you. And so they went back to a common sense notion of whiteness and said and consolidated them that people of Asian ancestry cannot become naturalized citizens. They could still if they were born here, but that was why it was critical then to keep women out. So then the other thing is, once you have this new category, alien ineligible for citizenship, then you get other laws that can be race neutral that use the category, even though the only group that is ineligible for naturalization or citizenship are Asians. So you can be facially race neutral, use that term, and the courts say it's okay. States pass alien land laws. Courts said, well, we created this category, so it's rational state for you to keep people of Japanese ancestry from owning the farmland, because if you didn't do that, Japanese people might end up owning all of the farmland in your state. The Washington State Supreme Court actually said that in defending or upholding Washington's alien land law, because if they did that, well, that affects the security. Now, you might think this is all just stuff in the past, but Florida last year passed a new alien land law, and they targeted people of Chinese, well, I say Chinese ancestry, but technically it's not. They, they, the category was people, people domiciled in China. So Chinese domiciliaries, I think that's a word, um, for harsher treatment in addition to um, preventing uh, others from certain other countries of concern. But, but Chinese were, were especially targeted for harsher consideration. The district court judge in that case, Alan Windsor, in the Northern District of Florida said, that's OK because of Terrace versus Thompson, the Washington alien land law case from 1923. Said US Supreme Court hasn't overturned this. Uh, and in a line that I just love, said, a Dutch person domiciled in China would be subjected to this restriction. So it's neutral. Neutral. But it's discrimination that produces uh, the Asian American racial subject. So um, this gets carried forward so that by the time you have World War II, the otherness of people of Asian ancestry is written into law, written into the Constitution, written into the fabric of what it means to be American. And you get then this notion of race and national security exceptionalism. National security is so important that will allow things that we might not otherwise allow with regard to the treatment of people of different races to go forward. Why? Because of national security. And so uh, near where I live, the first civilian exclusion order, exclusion order number one was Bainbridge Island, uh, which is an island in the Sound um, off of Seattle. Lieutenant General John L. DeWitt is in charge of all of this, promulgating these things. It leads to uh, families having to uh, gather very quickly their belongings and then collectively leave their community. Most of those from the Seattle area ended up in Camp Minidoka in Idaho. This is Camp Manzanar. I love this photograph because of the ironic juxtaposition of the United States flag with regard to this incarceration camp. You get these four people who said no and took legal challenges uh, 
up to the U.S. Supreme Court. Minoru Yasui, who was an attorney, graduated from the University of Oregon School of Law. And when the curfew came out targeting people of Japanese ancestry, and it said, persons of Japanese ancestry, alien and non-alien. And you're thinking, well, I know what an alien is, but what's a non-alien? And a non-alien is a U.S. citizen. But they didn't want to say that. And so they used the words to try to hide in some ways that a lot of what they were doing also included uh, U.S. citizens. Uh, on a Friday evening, he violated the curfew, walked around trying to get arrested. Police officer said, you're going to get in trouble. Go run along home. And so he presented himself to the police station and said, I'm Japanese. You have a law that says I need to be, you know, in my home during these hours. I'm not in my home. Arrest me. And they were happy to oblige him. He regrets having done that on a Friday evening. <laughs> and you all know why. Great court management. <laughs> and so he ended up in the drunk tank in Portland uh, until Monday morning when he could get arraigned. And he said, as a lawyer, he should have known better. <laughs> Gordon Hirabayashi was a student at the University of Washington. He defied the curfew and then later the exclusion order. So you had a curfew first, then an exclusion order. They were told to leave their homes. And it wasn't just that they could leave their homes and go anywhere. They had to report to a place, and then they were sent to a temporary quarters, which were often uh, state fairgrounds. And so you hear stories about horse stalls. So people living in horse stalls that are somehow repurposed uh, for their families before they end up in the hastily built incarceration camps that are further away from the coast. He violated both the curfew and the exclusion order. So Fred Korematsu was a 22-year-old uh, welder in the San Francisco Bay Area. And uh, he decided to defy the exclusion order. He thought that it was wrong. He got arrested, uh, and while he was in jail, Ernest Bessig, who was uh, with the uh, ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, came to him in jail and asked him, do you want to challenge this, uh, including all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court? And Fred said yes to that. Uh, he was convicted in federal district court in San Francisco, took his appeal up, the Ninth Circuit quickly kicked it up to the U.S. Supreme Court, and that's how he ended up up there. Uh, Mitsui Endo was a civil servant in California, and don't hold it against her, but she worked for the DMV. <laughs> um, after World War II broke out, she was fired along with everybody else of Japanese ancestry, but when approached, uh, by lawyers who asked if she wanted to join a class that was challenging, challenging her termination, she said yes, she wanted to challenge this. But then the exclusion order came down and she ended up in one of the incarceration camps. A lawyer then visited her in the incarceration camp and said, do you want to do a challenge? Thinking that because of her earlier stance, standing up to what California did, that she would say yes, and she said yes. Now. A lot of people know more about the three men, and many people have never even heard of Mitsui Endo. Now, one hilarious thing about it is the three men lost, she won. And so you might wonder a little bit, why don't we talk more about Mitsui Endo? One word is sexism. Um, the other also includes that uh, her case was thought to be not as important because the court decided it on non-constitutional grounds. Because by that point in time, her case was being considered. Uh, the War Relocation Authority had already, already determined that she was loyal to the United States. And so the US Supreme Court said the War Relocation Authority exceeded its authority by uh, continuing to incarcerate somebody they have deemed to be loyal to the United States. So she wins. But she, the court actually delays issuing its opinion, even though one of the justices said, come on, we're done with it. Why aren't we issuing the, the opinion? And we've learned since then that it had to do with wanting to wait to allow Roosevelt to announce, or the War Relocation Authority, to announce that they were going to be closing the camps. But the weird thing is, even though she won, she only won for herself, they announced the closure of the camps, but it was only a plan to close the camps. They didn't open them up. They kept people there for months afterwards, even though 
So all of them by that point in time, or most of them by that point in time, had been deemed to be loyal. The other thing is that the other cases got renewed attention, and her case didn't need renewed attention in the 1980s because she won her case. But in 1981, there was newly discovered evidence by Peter Irons and Ayaka Herzig Yoshinaga that found that Department of Justice lawyers had withheld evidence or facts before the US Supreme Court, withheld and or distorted them. And so that allowed this fancy Latin writ, writ of quorum nobis, to reopen the case. These three cases then proceeded, got a lot of public attention. In 1984, Fred Korematsu's conviction was overturned by Judge Marilyn Hall Patel. When she went to announce the order, she did this in the ceremonial courtroom in that courthouse. It was packed, and Fred talks about what a different experience it had been because when he was there in the 1940s, he felt completely alone. Gordon Hirabayashi's case, the court was assessing the constitutionality of the curfew, and I describe what the court does as the death of irony. This paragraph, if you read it, and I'm not going to read it now because I, 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 I lost time to the, the, <laughs> the false fire alarm, um, but um, it says, in essence, it's understandable that Japanese Americans might not like the United States because we discriminated against them, and we did it really well. And footnote four is a list of many of the things that states and the federal government had done to discriminate against people of Japanese ancestry. And I call it the death of irony because we need to discriminate against them because we discriminated against them. We have to continue to do so, and we need to do so because of national security. And so there's this moment, though, and this is where differential privilege operates. So how to tell Japanese from the Chinese? Um, angry citizens uh, you know, are attacking people who look like people of Japanese ancestry. The Chinese reporter feels like he needs to wear a sign that says, I'm a Chinese reporter, not Japanese, please. Life magazine does a photo spread and a story about how to tell the enemy Japanese from the friendly Chinese. And so apparently, the friendly Chinese have parchment yellow complexion. Japanese have an earthy yellow complexion. I, I often go to the mirror and it's like, today, do I have an earthy complexion? Do I have a <laughs> parchment yellow complexion? And apparently, the newspaper, the, the article talks about the Chinese stride forcefully, oh, I'm sorry, the Japanese stride forcefully, whereas the Chinese kind of shuffle along as a way then to tell the, the difference. So Chinese Americans, actually, a number of them develop lapel pins to try to identify themselves as Chinese and not Japanese. And it's completely understandable, because in that moment, with the violence that they were encountering, just because they were similar, well, people couldn't tell the difference between parchment yellow and earth, earthy yellow, right? Um, it's natural then that they responded in that moment by distancing themselves from the Japanese. but. They lost an opportunity in terms of solidarity. And I want to be careful because, you know, in that moment, right, I have no idea what that would have felt like and what the fear would have felt like. But the other thing is that it wasn't just the Chinese, it was everybody, nobody. The moment of, for solidarity passed without people joining and rising together because, well, it's another group that is being impacted. And so I'm going to skip uh, the piecemeal incorporation and get to um, sort of uh, the, the final theoretical aspect of my talk. When we're thinking about the different groups, sometimes we think about them as sort of operating, well, there's th how this group operates. And often it's black, white, and then it'll be Asian white, and then Latina and Latino white, and not understanding how everything fits together. And there's this idea, in some ways, of racial positioning, that there's a game that is played where there are tactics that are used as we're trying to figure out and negotiate our place in US society. We have this idea called racial triangulation that emerges in uh, Plessy versus Ferguson, that famous phrase, our constitution is colorblind in his dissent. What's weird is that most people forget the words immediately preceding that phrase, 
And it's the white race deems itself to be the dominant race in this country. And so it is in prestige, in achievements, in education, in wealth, and in power. So I doubt not it will continue to be for all time if it remains true to its great heritage. I have not seen a more naked pronouncement of white supremacy in the U.S. reports as this. Part of what Justice Harlan found offensive about the Louisiana statute was that it was a stain, that the white people didn't need things like this because the white people were always already going to be superior. But there's another idea, and this is where triangulation comes in. Harlan talks about how the black union veteran who fought to preserve the union can't sit in the car with the white people, whereas the Chinese person who we don't even let into this country is allowed to sit in the car with the white person. And so the white and black are put on a more horizontal plane of equality but juxtapose against the real other. And that's often what is done. There's this idea of triangulation. When we think about race hierarchy, sometimes it's this idea of, well, there's a white and a black, and each of the groups is trying to figure out their place. You know, and some trying to get to the white, you know, to the very top. Irish immigrants, when they came to the United States, were considered an inferior racial group because of the experience of being colonized by Great Britain. But they realized that a pathway to become advancement in U.S. society was to be able to claim whiteness. There's an example with the Baltimore ports where at one point in time, the cargo boats were offloaded by stevedores who were black. Irish workers wanted those jobs, so they did a public campaign, let's make this an all white waterfront, claiming a whiteness that had been denied to them, but eventually something that they were able to get. Tactical positioning, Gong Lum versus Rice. This is Martha Lum right here and her sister, older sister, uh, next to her. They're at school in Mississippi. Uh, the previous year, uh, both girls attended this white school with no problem, but then there started to be press in Mississippi about the growing Chinese problem. This new school year, she goes to school, she's allowed to in the morning, goes home for lunch, comes back, and the principal tells her, you can't come to the school, you gotta go to, and using the language of the time, the colored school. And her parents sue. Now here's the thing, I completely understand the parents wanting better educational opportunities, and it was pretty clear that the white school had much superior uh, facilities and, and materials and teachers than the colored school did, and I can understand then trying to get your kid into the white school. But if they had succeeded, it wasn't going to take down segregation, it was going to support segregation, just allowing them to have that privilege. And in their arguments, they tried to say, well, you have white, you have black, Chinese is closer to white than it is to black. This idea of racial positioning, but that's in some ways the game that they thought they needed to play instead of doing the bigger challenge, which is the system of overall race subordination. One thing is that the Chinese forgot how they ended up in Mississippi in the first place. And you're like, how did the Chinese end up in Mississippi in the first place? Well, after the Civil War, when black people were freed in the South, there were white landowners who thought, well, the black free workers, they're kind of troublesome. They're not good workers or they want too much. And so they found a more, what they thought was a more docile labor supply. You had labor contractors touring plantations in the South saying, you, we'll hook you up. You got the Chinese workers. They're gonna be good workers for you. They're compliant. They don't make waves. You can control them and you can pay them very little in terms of wages. That's how they ended up there. They were brought in to break the power of black workers and in pursuing this kind of litigation uh, in the way the legal strategy, strategy that they chose, um, they were actually reinforcing race segregation. So racial triangulation, um, we can think about the deployments so far. Uh, Bacon's Rebellion, uh, initially you had indentured white and black, propertied white, 
But then with the psychological wages of whiteness, you get propertied white and indentured and poor white brought up against the real racial other. And then through that, eventually you get a collapsing so that you get whiteness operating at the top because there's a common whiteness uh, that operates there. Martha Lum's legal argument, white Chinese closer to white than black. The Mississippi Supreme Court and the US Supreme Court said, nah, white on top, black and Chinese on the bottom. That's the triangle that operates there. Asian Americans as a model minority, black persons as American. So with regard to black persons as American in the 1980s when there were uh, attempts to make uh, certain immigration restrictions, Neoconservative white politicians went to black communities and said, you should join with us on these immigration restrictions because immigration is hurting you. We're the real Americans, they're not. And so you see the deployment of this. Counter deployments, Japanese Mexican Labor Association, the Oxner strike of 1903, Japanese workers and Mexican workers joined together in a successful strike. The Mexican workers then are offered a union place by the AFL, the American Federation of, of Labor, but only if they kick out the Japanese brothers. The Mexican workers say, no, they're our brothers. Privilege was offered to them. They would have benefited from it, but they had a different horizon in terms of where they thought the country should go. And even though they might get a little bit, they weren't going to, it was ultimately going to be self-defeating. And then Ralph Lazo for the win. Mexican-American teenager spent years in a Japanese-American incarceration camp. He just went with his friends. And it's like crazy that he would do something like that. So when privilege is offered to you, what will you do? So then we think about the long game. How do we come to participate in the struggles of those who are not us? That's a picture of my mentor, the late Jerome McChrystal Culp Jr. So how do we come to see ourselves and others? How do we see others in ourselves? And I think it's through learning your history, learning the history of others, uh, then it's on you. I mean, after that, you know, what do you do with that? What I hope that you will do is show up for yourself, but also show up for others. And that's how change will come about. And so we don't have time for these exercises. I had these exercise one and two. Um, so just in closing, um, what I've tried to set forth is to provide some of the information uh, that you may not have had and also to correct some of the misinformation uh, that you may have had because I think those are critical in thinking about how to include Asians, Asian Americans in these race justice conversations. Uh, I think sometimes there are presumptions about Asian Americans as well. They're the model minority, and maybe sometimes we're too accepting of the psychological wages of honorary whiteness, not understanding that maybe it's ultimately self-defeating. But through conversation with each other, I hope that we are able to then see ourselves in others and uh, that others see themselves in me and us. So with that, thank you very much. Um, and I realize I left no time for questions. And I know that there are other things uh, that, that need to happen. So thank you.